Welcome. This is a slightly modified version of the talk that I'm going to give at the Maryland Science Center on 5th of June 2012 about the Venus transit. I'm going to cover two subjects. Why is this event so rare? And why was it so important to observe this that some very famous people risked fortunes and life and limb in order to see this event? Let's first deal with the problem of why Venus transits are so rare. Intuitively, they shouldn't be. Venus and Earth are very close together in the solar system. If the Earth's distance from the Sun is defined as one astronomical unit, then the distance of Venus from the Sun is 0.72 astronomical units. The Earth has an orbital period of 365 days, where Venus has an orbital period of 225 days. So imagine they would encounter one another far more regularly. Well, let's actually work out how often Venus overtakes the Earth. Venus has the inside track, so we'll start Venus and Earth as they are currently uh, lined up with the Sun. Uh, they will rotate anti-clockwise around the Sun viewed from the north and after one Venus year Venus has returned to the same position as before 225 days later but the Earth has only gone two-thirds of the way around its orbit. Another 225 days later Venus has orbited twice around the Sun whereas the Earth has only gone round about one and a third times. How long does it take Venus to actually catch up with the Earth and overtake it? And the answer is 584 days. Why should we be getting another transit in 584 days? The issue is that this is a two-dimensional depiction of their orbits. What we need to do is look at them in three dimensions and we see there's another factor that we haven't taken into account. Namely, the two orbital planes are inclined one with another by about 3.4 degrees. And that means there's only twice a year when Earth could see Venus between the Sun and us. That's on, on or about the 6th of June or the 8th of December. But for that to happen, Venus must also be at that location at that time. And the chances of that happening are very unlikely. And so that's what makes this such a rare event. In fact, none of us will ever see another one. Probably our children won't see another one. Our great-grandchildren just might. Well, on that cheery note, let's turn to see how often these events actually do occur. Now here is a list of the five transits uh, that have already occurred, the one that's going to occur today, and the two that are subsequent. Now, do you see a pattern in the uh, numbers of these dates? Well, perhaps if we take the differences, it becomes far more apparent. Now the pattern becomes apparent. We have gaps of 8, 105, 8, 122, 8, 105, 8, and I'm sure you can guess what the next gap is going to be. So from this, you could predict the upcoming Venus transits for the next 1,000 or 10,000 years if you wish to. So what was the scientific problem that so many famous people wanted to get involved with? This included Aristarchus, Ptolemy, Copernicus, Kepler, Halley, Horrocks. There's a Maryland connection through Mason and Dixon, and even Captain Cook got in on the act. Well, the issue was Kepler's second law, which said that the square of the period of a planet's orbit is proportional to its distance from the Sun. So hence we could tell how far each planet was from the Sun in terms of astronomical units, by just measuring their orbital period with respect to that of the Earth. The only problem is, is we didn't know the distance from the Earth to the Sun, so we didn't know how many miles or kilometers that astronomical unit corresponded to. And so the search over the years was to scale the whole solar system. Now, some of the early Greek scientists, particularly Aristarchus and Ptolemy, tried to make an effort to do this, but they got the number completely wrong, only a few million kilometers, which is a large underestimate. Following them, Tycho and Copernicus tried to do the same thing and got a very similar result. But there was a problem, Mars. If the solar system was as small as they were claiming, then Tycho should have been able to measure the distance to Mars very easily, and he couldn't. That meant one of two things. Either Kepler's second law was wrong, or Mars was further away than the earlier measurements of the astronomical unit would indicate. The solution to the problem was to use a phenomenon called parallax. And this is where the Venus transit comes into the picture. Venus is a perfect object to measure the distance of the solar system using parallax. But what is parallax? Well, let's try the finger test. I'd like you to hold your finger up vertically towards the ceiling, and then align it with both eyes open on a distant object. Now close your left eye, and the object will jump to the right. Now close your right eye and open the left, and the object jumps to the left. If you then measure the angle that the finger moved, and you know the distance between your eyes, 
you can figure how far that finger was away from your face. So this is the principle we're going to use with Venus. So as we know that the Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun, and Kepler's law tells us that Venus's distance from the Sun is 0.72 astronomical units, so if we can use parallax and measure the distance of, uh, from Earth to Venus in miles, then we could scale that to make an estimate of the uh, astronomical unit, and hence scale the whole solar system. Now this is how the finger test works for Venus. You have an observer in the northern hemisphere and an observer in the southern hemisphere who observe the same transit. The one in the northern hemisphere will see the planet cross the solar disk further to the south than the one in the, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, <clears throat> you can measure that angular distance knowing that the sun is approximately half a degree across and as you know the distance between A and B on, on the Earth, you can tell how far Venus is away. So this is the object of most of these uh, daring attempts to observe Venus transits in the past. Horrocks actually discovered that there was going to be a transit in 1639 when he found an error in Kepler's calculations. He would bought one of these newfangled telescope things. He observed the transit uh, from Northern England with a partner in Southern England, but they never even bothered to publish the results. Haley calculated the date of the 1761 transit, uh, but died before it happened and proved himself right. As I said before, Mason and Dixon travelled all the way to Cape Town to observe the 1761 transit, uh, which is no mean feat in those days, that's a long way to travel. They got very good observations and as a result of that they got hired to, to, to settle the dispute between Pennsylvania and Maryland as to where their borders were, the so-called Mason-Dixon line. And Captain Cook got in on the act from the point of view that he had to sail to Tahiti. It's a dirty job but somebody's got to do it. But even he had his own problems associated with this trip. He arrived in Tahiti with a ship full of sailors who had been at sea for very many months and uh, the Tahitian islands are famed for their very beautiful women. The problem with the Tahiti is that they have no natural recurring metals on the island. And so metal objects are very, very desired by the uh, islanders. So you have a bunch of lonely sailors on a wooden ship that's largely held together by nails, a large number of uh, very accommodating young ladies who would do anything, literally anything, for some nails. So poor old Captain Cook had to post guards on his uh, carpentry tools and on the spare nails that he has in the holds. Now it's not recorded as to what he paid those guards in order to guard the uh, nails and the carpentry tools, but my suspicion it was probably in nails. There are many stories of uh, the trials and tribulations of other uh, transit expeditions uh, over the years. But the saddest one of all probably belongs to that of Le Gentil, a famous French scientist of his day. He spent 11 years away from home to observe the two transits in 1761 and 1769. He was travelling to a French colony in India when he learned that it had been taken over by the British. So he diverted his ship to the Philippines in Manila to set up his experiment there. However, the Spanish governor of Manila thought he was a French spy and was going to have him arrested, so he had to flee. In the meantime, he'd heard that his original island had been uh, returned to the French by the British, and so he started to set sail for there. However, he had a dispute with the pilot of the ship, uh, who sulked in his cabin for days, delaying the uh, ship and almost actually getting it shipwrecked. This delay was costly indeed, for he never reached dry land before the uh, transit started and he was unable to take any useful observations from the rolling ship's deck, despite the fact that it was crystal clear. Well, he decided to wait around for eight years for the next uh, transit, and got into various adventures, including getting dysentery and nearly dying of fever. In the meantime, he built himself a very nice observatory ready for the next transit. And after months of beautiful crystal clear weather, it turned out that uh, on the day of the transit, he got clouded out. So after all this time uh, away from home, he never got any useful data to use at all. But if you think arriving home was uh, the end of his problems, it was just the beginning. When he got home, he found that his wife had divorced him and remarried. His relatives had declared him dead and that uh, they had looted his estate of anything valuable. His housekeeper had let the house go to rack and ruin, so he didn't have a home to live in or a roof over his head. 
The Science Academy, where he worked, had given his chair of his department away to another scientist, so he had no job or income. He spent most of the rest of his life suing anybody for any particular reason he could think of, but he did have one piece of luck. He died quietly in his sleep. Well, why was this uh, a piece of luck? Well, he was a member of the aristocracy and he died just before the beginning of the French Revolution, which would almost certainly meant that he'd been arrested and executed rather gruesomely. If we look back at the history of trying to measure the size of the solar system, we can see that the early results were very, very poor indeed. If Horrocks had actually published his results, it would have been somewhat of a sensation as he would have put the size of the solar system at 10 times the, the size that it was before. Later observations using parallax got much better results, and you can compare that with the current radar result of 149.9 uh, million kilometers. So that's it for today. Keep safe. Bye for now.